Eden Project's a living theatre of plants and people and it's built in this massive bowl which used to be a china clay pit. Hi, I'm Jo and I work at the Eden Project in Cornwall and I'm Director of Interpretation, which doesn't mean I speak different languages, it means I talk to scientists and all sorts of other fascinating people from across the world and present their views here in our living theatre. In 1995, there was a guy called Tim Smith, Sir Tim Smith now, and he'd moved down to Cornwall because he wanted to start a rare breeds farm. He found a garden which was completely overgrown found out who owned it. Tim said, well, I'll help you restore it. And they restored it, and they found out it was a Victorian garden. And so he started to get really interested in plants. And around the same time, the Millennium Commission, which is what they were called then, they're called the Big Lottery now. You buy a lottery ticket and some money goes to good causes. In the year 2000, they'd taken this money and they wanted to give it to projects who raised their eyes to the skies and totally transformed thinking. So Tim said, oh, well, let's build the biggest greenhouse in the world in a hole in the middle of Cornwall where nobody can see it and put a rainforest in it to demonstrate transformation. Sounds like a good idea. So I rocked up to speak to Tim actually before this because all these lorries weren't here. And the first thing he did was take me down and show me this crater in the ground. And I remember stand, I was standing about there. He said, we're going to build a rainforest here. We've got a bit of Mediterranean biome here, we'll put the Vista Centre here, and there'll be all these crops. We'll put a lake in the centre and create this amazing transformation of a global garden. And he said, I'm going to tell stories of plants and people because they're amazing, and there's people think plants are about as interesting as watching paint dry. And I said, well, that's quite interesting because the reason paint dries is because it's made of a plant. And he was like, oh, but how do you know about all this? He said, I said, well, I tell stories of plants and people. And he said, will you quit your job and come and help me set this place up? So I said, yes. It's designed so you can sort of get lost in it and have fun and wander around, but it does have quite a, a deep narrative behind it. So the rainforest and, and med, half of it's wild, half of it's cultivated, and we're going and have a look. The stage is where we have our big summer programme. And then outside, this is all food crops. This is about time and energy. This is about creativity and play. This is about water. And this bit round the edge is the wild edge. It all transpired he didn't have any money. So then he went to the Millennium Commission who were giving out grants there and there were three categories. You could get an A, go build it. A B, go back and work it out. And C, um, no good. So any idea what we got? C. Yeah, we got a C, yeah, yeah. So he came back and we said, you know, what have you got? And he said, well, it's a sort of A or B or sort of C or shit. So he went back and he said, what would you rather have written on your tombstone? I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. The biome that's closest to us is the smaller one, believe it or not. And that's the Mediterranean biome. And then the one in the distance is the rainforest, which is the biggie, which is 200 metres by 100 by 50 with no internal support. So it's like this, this giant bubble. And that's, that's where we're going to the rainforest. We had no soil, which isn't ideal for a global garden. So we made 83,000 tonnes of soil from recycled waste. I hate the word waste, from recycled stuff. And there was no plants and there was no stable sides at all. So we got something called a monitor, which is a massive machine. They used to squirt at the china clay pits to mine the china clay, which is rotten granite basically. And so we got this monitor and instead of putting water in it, we put in liquid soil and seeds and we just sprayed. And then the seeds germinated and the roots went in and they became the anchors, which held it all together. So we used plants for everything from the second we started. The biomes are based on animal architecture maximum strength using minimum materials, which is what bees do, hexagons, so we used hexagons. But they're actually twin layer space frames, so there's a layer of hexagons and, and another layer of hexagons inside, which are slightly twisted, and they're made of steel. And the structures are huge, and they're very, very light. So the weight of the rainforest biome, I always try and remember this, the weight of the rainforest biome is 465 tonnes, and you think, well, so what? But the weight of the air inside it, it's 420,000 tonnes. So it's, it's the weight of the biome is the same as the weight of the air inside it, basically. The material's called ethyl tetrafluoroethylene. It's called ETFE, which is sort of cling film with attitude. It is plastic, but it's recyclable plastic. And it transmits ultraviolet, so the plants inside get, they get proper daylight, and you can get suntan inside as well, so you've got to wear 
sun cream when you're inside. Every single piece is numbered. It was like a giant Meccano set, so it would only fit in one particular place. So all the hexagons are slightly different sizes. And you can see little knobbly bits sticking up on the outside. And that's where the sky monkeys, who are climbers, um, climb up onto the roof and clean all the gutters and everything. The local council, thank goodness, gave us a bit of money at the start. The local college decided to pay me for two years, which was a miracle. And in the end, the Millennium Commission did give us the biggest chunk of the money. So the rest, as you can see, is history because it actually happened. And we did build the biggest greenhouse in the world and put it in a hole in the middle of Cornwall and build a global garden. Welcome to the rainforest. It's exciting because you've never been in it before. So we're going to go round through the wild areas. You've got the Tropic Trader. And the interesting thing about the Tropic Trader, it is an actual prow of a real ship. Because the biome's so big, people don't notice that. So we put it in thinking it was a really good idea at the time, and then nobody even notices it. We go through to tropical islands. We work very closely with the National Tropical Botanic Garden in Hawaii. 3,000 years ago, the Polynesians went from the South Pacific to Hawaii, went back 3,000 miles, picked up 27 plants they needed to start a new civilization. This is the rosy periwinkle, and there was a, a famous footballer in the, there is a famous footballer in the UK called Gary Lineker, and his son was very poorly, and the chemical from this plant saved his life. Only 5% of the plants in the rainforest have been tested for their medical uses, so we need to save the rainforest because it's full of medicines, we don't half them we don't even know about. So all the plants in here, when they came in, they were either seeds or cuttings. Mainly we got them from Europe because we didn't want to take anything out of the wild. So we're now stepping from tropical islands into Southeast Asia. So different plants again, but they, they have the same adaptations. So they look really similar. They tend to have really big leaves. If the leaves are high up, they tend to be able to rip easily because of the wind. A group of people from Eden went to each of the uh, tropical areas to talk to local people there to see what stories we should tell so we didn't just make up a story about somebody else, we went and asked them. And then we wanted to represent tribal people. We distinguished between indigenous people who live and work within the tropics with tribal people who are separated from, from modern society. We've now moved into West Africa, working with a project in West Africa on agroforestry where a lot of the trees in the rainforest have been clumped together and they're all useful plants. This, believe it or not, is new, this path, because people were coming and they said, well, we know the rainforest is important to, for biodiversity, but why do we need to save them? And we said, well, they, they cool the earth. And they went, what? Because it's really hot. So we worked with the scientists, got all the complicated information and boiled it down. So they move the air, reflect the sun, make the rain, sweat water, catch carbon and defend from floods. So that's somebody's poor from like 20 year research project. I was fortunate enough to go to Guyana in tropical South America. We lived in this hut with a corrugated roof and every afternoon at four o'clock it did this. This pays homage to my biology tutor who got me into botany in the first place, Dr. Dodge. He said, stand up, your feet are nailed to the ground. So we stood up and he said, do you want to eat? There's some food over there. You want a drink? It's over there. You want to cuddle that bloke? He's over there. He, and there's a tiger coming, you can't move. He said, plants eat, drink, have sex, and survive danger without moving. And I'm going to spend the next four years telling you how they do it. And then he left the room. So we wanted to show how rainforests make clouds without writing too many words. I don't know about your camera, but it's really nice and cool in there. All the water from the waterfall is, is the rainwater we've collected. So the water's collected, it washes off the biomes and then it's pumped into tanks and those tanks are used for all the watering of the plants and to flush the loo. Going through into the crops area now. When we first put this exhibit in, the horticulture team complained. They said, all oh, the soil keeps washing away. People are cutting down the rainforest, slash and burn to, to grow crops. In the Amazon, that's been happening for centuries, but it's been done sustainably, but now it's like, out of control cutting down and because we've got climate change we're having more lightning strikes and the lightning strikes are hitting the emergent the big trees and then that's causing fires as well and the drier the forest the more fires you get 
So with people cutting it down and with climate change, we've got to keep them alive and we can replant them so it is possible to regrow it. In places of forest which have been burnt or cut down, they're growing Inga trees. The Inga trees grow up and fix the nitrogen, then they cut them again and they plant crops between and then the trees grow back up in it. It's this really good cycle. So we're tapping our rubber trees. We also sell in the shop and advocate wild rubber. So we wanted to do something really simple. So you've got the oil palm plantation and the forest. Vanilla, and then we've got all these spices. The one at the back is cardamom, and that is the rainforest bio. If you make uh, compost, and if you live in the city, you can make it in a worm bin on your, in your backyard or on your balcony, or even in your kitchen, apparently, um, and recycle all that waste. That locks down as much carbon as you've produced by boiling your kettle with electric for a whole year. We've got 17 different waste streams on site. So we compost, all of our food waste is composted and, and used um, in the gardens. And we recycle the glass, and we recycle the paper, and we recycle the cardboard. We've just found somebody who can recycle crisp packets. Mediterranean bio. So we have the perfume garden. You come through into the Mediterranean, California, South Africa, Western Australia. Totally different places, same climate. It's just where all the wine comes from. And then through into the crop zone. And then in the middle, we have a Mediterranean cafe where you can eat all the food that you've just seen. And our olive trees had reached the end of their life in where they came from. And they were going to put a road in, so we rescued them, but they had to go in quarantine for 18 months. Right in front of me is one that's one and a half thousand years old. So it's seen, it's seen a great deal. And we have storytellers. So every day at 12 and 2, the storytellers come out and, and tell a story. These guys are doing the Library of Life, LOL. So all, all these nets, ghost nets, make them into chairs. And it shouldn't go in there in the first place, but when it is in there, let's do something with it. So here we've got some more crops. We've got aubergines, we've got tomatoes, we've got cork. The cork tree is one of the only trees, that if you take its bark off, it doesn't die. Most trees die if you take their bark off. It's really light. So it's used in spaceships, it's used in railways, on the tracks. It's got so many different uses. So you can harvest it and keep the forest alive at the same time. So it's lovely in the restaurant in there, we do weddings and all sorts. And when you, when you eat in there, and you're in the middle of a meeting and chatting away, you can really suspend disbelief about where you are. I think the most important thing is awareness of how you fit within the planet and then you will do many things then you will reduce how much stuff you use you'll recycle everything you can you'll repair stuff rather than over consume it's understanding how you operate within the whole whole world and the fact that together all of you can make a difference <laughs>